Welcome to this week's edition of Flashback Friday, your opportunity to get some good review by listening to episodes from the past that Jason has handpicked to help you today in the present and propel you into the future. Enjoy. This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company. For more information and links to all our great podcasts, visit HartmanMedia.com. Welcome to Creating Wealth with Jason Hartman. During this program, Jason is going to tell you some really exciting things that you probably haven't thought of before and a new slant on investing. Fresh new approaches to America's best investment that will enable you to create more wealth and happiness than you ever thought possible. Jason is a genuine, self-made, multi-millionaire who not only talks the talk, but walks the walk. He's been a successful investor for 20 years and currently owns properties in 11 states and 17 cities. This program will help you follow in Jason's footsteps on the road to financial freedom. You really can do it. And now here's your host, Jason Hartman, with the complete solution for real estate investors. It's my pleasure to welcome Greg Pallas to the show. He is a true investigative journalist, and I say that because there are so few of them left nowadays. He reports for the BBC and The Guardian, among others, and we'll give out some websites and links where you can find his information. He's the reporter for a uh, documentary entitled Vultures and Vote Rustlers, and is is the author of New York Times bestsellers, The Best Democracy Money Can Buy, Armed Madhouse, Vultures Picnic, and Billionaires and Ballot Bandits, and it's great to welcome him today. Greg, how are you doing? Great. Glad to be with you, Jason. Well, we're glad to have you, and where are you located, just to give our listeners a sense of geography? Well, right now I'm located in New York. I report for BBC Television out of London. Fantastic. Well, tell us a little bit about some of your thoughts on the global financial meltdown, globalization, Goldman Sachs. Those kind of things. I mean, you report on a wide variety of issues, but I, I wanted to maybe mainly touch on those. Yeah, my specialty is following the money. I, I my degree in finance, and and one of the things I like to do in 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 my work as investigative reporter, it's amazing how many documents kind of fall through my little chimney. And one document was an, a confidential document, a confidential memo sent by Tim Geithner, who was our Secretary of Treasury recently, to Larry Summers, who was um, um, in uh, New York. Both uh, Larry Summers and Tim Geithner had had traded uh, terms as U.S. Secretary of the Treasury under Bill Clinton and under uh, Barack Obama. This goes way back uh, to 97. Now, why would we be interested in this memo? The answer is because the memo, in the memo, Geithner tells Summers that it's we're about to enter the end game. Now, what the, was the game that they were playing and why was it ending? And in this memo, which you'll see on Vultures and Vote Rustlers, in this memo, Geithner's talking about a meeting between Larry Summers, Robert Rubin, and the top bankers in America, secret meetings, which, by the way, were illegal because you can't have secret meetings. They can meet, but they can't hide it from the public. And there's a good reason why they're hiding it. This is the head of of um, Bank of America, of Citibank, of J.P. Morgan Chase, of Goldman Sachs. These guys are secretly getting together. And believe me, this is like a conspiracy nuts wet dream. They were getting together to decide how they could rip apart the policing of the financial system worldwide. Now, why would they want to do something that berserk? The answer was that Goldman and J.P. Morgan had just created a brand new so-called market, not in goods, but in bads, in toxic derivatives, in uh, financial derivatives. Uh, In fact, J.P. Morgan had 88 trillion, that's trillion with a T, trillion dollars of of, uh, toxic assets on its balance sheet trillion dollars. They had to offload them. So they had to, you can't, and this is the result of deregulating the U.S. financial market or decriminalizing, I should say. that Deregulating is a very polite term for decriminalizing previously criminal activity. That's a better word, decriminalizing or, or just selectively or really not at all enforcing. 
I mean, I, I sort of wonder right. if we need any more laws. We just need enforcement of the laws we have on the books. Well, um, in this case, they were they were ripping off the laws, the regulation, the enforcement for sure. And but you know, if if the U.S. goes berserk, and like if, for example, if you take all the cops off the street and all the security guards out of the banks, people are going to move their money to other nations. How do you prevent that? The answer is you remove the 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 financial police worldwide. How do they re, uh, re eliminate the financial police worldwide? They do that by um, uh, by deregulating banks worldwide. Now, how can you possibly do that? The answer was quite brilliant, and that's what was in the end game memo. The game was to use the World Trade Organization, the World Trade Organization rules, to basically eliminate financial regulation worldwide. Now, how could now how does that work? The answer was every nation in the world wants to trade with the United States. We're the biggest market. We're the people with the credit cards and the PayPal, and we, we buy everyone's goodies. If you want to sell into the U.S. market, and for most nations, that's life or death, the, the deal was you can't sell us your bananas unless you agree to tear down your financial regulations and agree to accept in return for your bananas and uh, engine parts and uh, raw material that you accept in payment our our derivatives and toxic assets and collateralized debt obligations and mortgage uh, securities the securitized uh, mortgage bundles so the world to trade with the US basically faced if you, your economy collapses or you accept uh, JP Morgan's um, toxic junk and uh, and that's what we found in the memo. In fact, I, I when I say it's, to confirm this, and you'll see this in Vultures and Vote Rustlers, I actually fly to Geneva. Summers and Geithner wouldn't speak to me. A member of Bill Clinton's cabinet did speak to me to confirm that the uh, documents were true. Uh, Joe Stiglitz, who later won the Nobel Prize, he's head of the Council of Economic Advisors. He said, yes, this was going on. It was, hor it was horrifying. It was horrifying. And he was scared to death. He told everyone, listen, this, this is going to blow up in our face. And they fired him. Then I flew off to Geneva, Switzerland, and met with the uh, head of the WTO, of the World Trade Organization. I met with the Generalissimo of Globalization himself. And yes, he confirmed this memo and many others that I got from the inside. Then I flew off to Ecuador to, in South America and met with the president of Ecuador, Actually, I met with two presidents of Ecuador, the one going in and one coming out, um, and two presidents of Ecuador, and uh, went over the documents uh, of Ecuador as an example, where Ecuador is told, you're not getting your, we're not going to buy your bananas, baby, unless you accept our toxic junk, unless you deregulate your banks. Welcome to this week's edition of Flashback Friday, your opportunity to get some good review by listening to episodes from the past that Jason has handpicked to help you today in the present and propel you into the future. Enjoy. This was a, not a small issue in, in Ecuador because the nation exploded. They, they deregulated their banks. The money flew out of uh, Ecuador banks to Florida. The toxic junk arrived. The, the Ecuador's banks collapsed. And um, there were riots in the capital when hungry um, Quechua Indians came down from the uh, Andes and burnt down the capital. So the president of Ecuador, who, by the way, was a, an economist uh, at an American university, he was fascinated by this material. He said, can I have a copy of these documents? I said, well, it says Ecuador on it. I'm sure you can. But uh, he said, yeah, there's no question. This was uh, he suspected this was happening. And but he didn't know about it. even the president of Ecuador didn't know about secret deals between Ecuador and his own nation's fine, uh, his own nation's finance minister, the World Trade Organization and the U.S. Treasury. Unbelievable. Just unbelievable. But let's just back up for a moment and just talk about the, the kind of the context of this. I mean, these are negotiations of deals between countries. So yes. one country has this to exchange for another country who has that to exchange. And they, they, they come together and it's a meeting of the minds. So isn't this just a meeting of the minds? Isn't this just a business deal? I mean, is it right to blame the U.S. for cutting a good deal for themselves? Well, let's break that into two parts. First of all, let's not blame the U.S. Jason, 
you weren't contacted to approve this. I <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. They didn't say, hey, hey, Jason, hey, Greg Palast, uh, what do you think of this idea? Will this benefit you as a citizen of America? Right. right. <laughs> like, yeah. It's, it's more was, about lobbyists for Goldman Sachs, of course. Yeah, yeah. It, was, right. it wasn't even lobbyists. It was the actual top guys. Oh, here, you'll enjoy this one, by the way. To, one of the ways I confirmed the authenticity of this memo is that it had the private phone numbers of the top guys at Citibank and Bank of America and Goldman. So I called. I pick. I used to call the phone numbers, you know, and you didn't get to a secretary. You didn't get to, you know, did, some did, did Lloyd Blankfein answer his I cell phone? <laughs> actually got first. I got to uh, the uh, the uh, former CEO of um, of Citibank, Kaminsky, and um, and I got him. Hi. <laughs> And he was surprised that it wasn't, you know, it was kind of a special line to the U.S. Secretary of the Treasury. And, of course, I had to declare I'm Greg Palace, BBC Television. <laughs> and then so that was a quick, that was a quickly ended conversation. Suddenly all those numbers went dead. But it was funny. Those those numbers were quite authentic. And, uh, in fact, you can get them. You can dial them yourselves. You'll see. Uh, but the um, uh, they, they don't go to those presidents anymore and those CEOs. But uh, so I had to go confirm this stuff. But no, it was not a, a fair deal between two nations. Like I said, we Americans didn't get anything out of it. Now, when we have trade negotiations between nations, it's trade in goods. In other words, we get Ecuador's bananas, which is that's their, that is their main export until recently oil. We get Ecuador's bananas and we sell them computers or engine parts. Uh, actually, our computers come from China. We deal with China in return. We sell them Boeing uh, airplanes. That's called trade in goods. What this was, Jason, was a trade in bads. In other words, we get their bananas and we give them uh, collateralized debt obligations, which are like bags of poop. A uh, financial poop, you know, it, you can well, fertilize. This, this, is, this is one of the ways, you know, a lot of people, Greg, a lot of the guests on my shows, and, you know, I've read extensively about it. For some reason, I have this morbid fascination with, with doom and the end of the world and the dollar collapse. You know, and a lot of people talk about how the dollar is going to collapse, America is going to collapse, there's going to be a, another economic meltdown and so forth. But what you're talking about right now is just one more of so many examples examples of the John Perkins uh, style economic hitmen concept, you know, where the U.S. is bullying the rest of the world into these bad deals. And it's not fair. It's not right. But the argument that I make is that it can continue for decades to come. Well, I, I want to just, you know, just again emphasize it's not America that is forcing the rest of the world to eat financial poison, collateralized debt obligations, et cetera. Just so you know, I mean, I, I even I, I have you a- You want to make the distinction that it's the Wall Street banksters. It's the banksters and you're talking about in collaboration with uh, the top Treasury Department officials. I'm talking about the head of the, the Treasury secretaries. And so it's not, again, the American people. Citibank, for example- Robert Rubin at this time was Secretary of Treasury. He had come, he had been prior the CEO of Goldman Sachs, become Secretary of the Treasury. While he's Secretary of the Treasury, there was an illegal at that time, because banking deregulation hadn't been signed yet. There was an e illegal combination of American Express with Citigroup, with Citibank, uh, creating something called Citigroup. Now, that was combining investment banking with Commercial banking, where you keep your savings in a, in a nice little kind of piggy bank, which is guaranteed by the U.S. Treasury. So now we have investment banking, which is kind of financial casino. You have suddenly the American public is on the hook backing a casino rather than a piggy bank. That was completely illegal, but Robert Rubin you know, turned a blind eye, didn't object, then changed the law to, again, decriminalize it. And within six months, he left the Treasury. Within six months, he was made co-chairman of this new combined previously illegal entity he was paid compensation robert rubin of 110 million dollars goes from the u.s treasury sits on top of an illegal combination makes 110 million dollars it goes bankrupt and the u.s treasury puts in 50 billion dollars in bailout money that's you and me 
and four trillion, and that's with a T, four trillion dollars in loan guarantees to Citibank. This is how it works. Now, you, again, it's not the American people. It's not the American government or the America. It's not America that did this. It is the guys at the top getting together and cutting the deals for themselves at your expense and my expense and the expense of places like Ecuador, which burnt down at the expense of places like Peru, which well, burnt down Iceland. and Iceland, which melted. And, you know, in Iceland, they were fairly sensible. In Iceland, they arrested the prime minister and the finance minister for uh, the shenanigans, and they threw them in, in prison for, for, for melting the nation's uh, economy. In, in our in the case of the United States, you don't get hard time, you get bonuses. And, and that's part of the problem here, is that, like I say, we've decriminalized this type of thing. It used to be called, when you used to sell derivatives of derivatives of derivatives, these eighth order derivatives, that used to be called selling watered stock. And you would, you know, like that is you're selling an ass, a, a, a security, which actually has no asset, no thing under it that it represents. That used to be against the law. Then it became, then suddenly guys like Lloyd Blankfein and, and uh, Rubin and Jamie Dimon, suddenly they're geniuses because Look at them. They're selling all this brilliant stuff, and look how much money they're making. Well, yeah, I mean, if you sold counterfeit lottery tickets, you could probably make a great deal of money. I don't see how that makes you brilliant. And then, in fact, in the case of, of uh, Goldman Sachs, when they offloaded mortgage securities that they knew were going to go bust, they knew were going to go bust, and they offloaded them to Iceland and to European credit unions and the Royal Bank of Scotland – and all these places went bankrupt. Royal Bank of Scotland, the biggest bank in Britain, went bankrupt. The CEO of Goldman Sachs was considered a genius because he offloaded this junk. Well, he knew it was junk. In fact, with a uh, investment banker named Paulson, Goldman Sachs bet that the mortgage securities that they sold would go bust. And Goldman and their client made $4 billion when those securities went bust. In other words, it's like a, a car dealer selling you a car and betting immediately, putting a bet that your car will blow up and explode in 24 hours. It's just unbelievable. So what's essentially happened here is that the U.S. government has been hijacked by the banksters and the, uh, the high, high-level ultra-rich corporatocracy through lobbyists, is that how? Yeah, well, I mean, in, in the case of Clinton and Bush and Obama, so it's a bipartisan deal, we stopped having lobbyists influence the government. They became the government. So like I say, Robert Rubin, the Secretary of Treasury, came from Goldman Sachs and then went to this new kind of Citigroup monster that collapsed. Larry Summers became a, a, a big shot uh, um, investment banker being paid millions of dollars by these same guys whose companies he created as secretary of the treasury. And so they all became part of the, in other words, it was no longer, as I say, the case of lobbying or influencing the government. They became the government and, and used it as their own little, um, their own, it's like they, they took a hammer, busted it open and, and took the money out as their own little piggy bank. And, and that's the problem is that, is that our government has become the banksters. For example, uh, in the case of Barack Obama, and, and you had asked me before the show whether I was on the left or the right or the whatever, and, and I was laughing because, you know, the right uh, thinks I'm on the left and the left thinks I'm on the right. And and it's uh, and the thing is, I'm an investigative reporter. So, so I go after both. In the case of Barack Obama, who had ever heard of this guy, right? The one we were waiting for, yeah, you the, know, the, the one Mr. who Hope came out change. of nowhere. Yeah. He came out of kind of nowhere. Uh, I was, by the way, I lived in his district as a state senator in Chicago, and he was an, a nobody, uh, Obama. And uh, until a bankster, a billionaireess named Penny Pritzker, who's worth about, it was worth about $4 billion, picked this guy out because she had been running a bank in his state senate district called superior bank which had fleeced all the poor people this is a very poor community had fleeced all these poor people with crazy subprime loans she was one of the inventors of subprime loans it caused tremendous destruction 
because this junk was considered illegal at the time, Penny Pritzker personally, with her brother, was fined $400 million. I don't think anyone in American history has been personally fined $400 million except Penny Pritzker. She was barred from ever uh, having anything to do with banking. So she decided the only thing she could do was pick a president. So she found Obama, decided to make him president, set him up with Rob as a, in a deal with Robert Rubin and Jamie Dimon, who lived in Chicago. Pritzker, Dimon, and Rubin put the big money behind Obama. And um, when he became president, of course, um, he picked Rubin's guys to run the Treasury Department. And today, Penny Pritzker, who had the, one of the biggest – uh, fine, the biggest fine in American history for a criminal operation who is not allowed to get near a U.S. bank by a consent decree is the United States Secretary of Commerce. He's in her cap. He's in Obama's cabinet. She's in Obama's cabinet. So there it is. I mean, you, you, you couldn't write fiction like this. I mean, this is just unbelievable. I, I, we live in a this is a crazy world. Yeah, and so – and that's why and, – and, and Tim Geithner, the guy who doesn't file his tax returns, becomes Treasury Secretary. I mean, you know, this is just insanity. <laughs> it's so well, obvious. And, yeah, and, and the thing is is that you know, the U.S. papers would not touch this issue of Penny Pritzker becoming Secretary of Commerce. The, she was blocked, by the way, in his first term by labor unions because she was known as a, as a union buster and on top of everything else. But the uh, even the unions have lost their clout because, after all, she raised three quarters of a billion dollars for him. And I know that there's the myth, and my Democratic Party friends don't like this. There's a myth that that Obama was created by this kind of kitty campaign and pe- people putting in nickels and dimes and all these small donors. That's a bunch of crock because, yes, they the, the suckers came along and put in their nickels and dimes. But after Robert Rubin and Jamie Dimon and Penny Pritzker and, and a group she literally called the Ladies That Lunch – on the Gold Coast of Chicago, who got together with Obama after they created this guy. That's what made him president. And he returned the favor. He didn't put any nickel and dimer donor in, in the cabinet. He put Penny Pritzker in the cabinet. And I would like someone to tell me what qualifies her other than raising three quarters of a billion dollars for Obama. And when, and imagine how... What Rachel Maddow would say if George Bush took in someone who had one of the biggest criminal activity fines in finance in American history and put that person in the cabinet. I mean, this is someone that makes Dick Cheney look like a Muppet. I know. That's- it's just crazy. It's just crazy. The thing the thing that I, I get to, Greg, is is I, I you, you mentioned right at the beginning of the show, you talked about lack of regulation, right, and, and decriminalization of these various unethical activities. I, I want to see illegal, but maybe they're not actually illegal in, in the financial world. However, I, I really wonder, though, from a broader perspective, if we just back up and we look at this from the 60,000 foot level and, and we look at the whole game and the way it's played, if it isn't regulation that backdrop that really brought us here in the first place. Because if these companies, they they go on TV and they talk about how they don't like government regulation and so forth, but they really love it because it helps them create and maintain monopolies. It makes it impossible for new players to enter their markets and get on their turf because the compliance burden is so high. Now, of course, once you get to the stage when you're too big to fail, then it becomes wonderful because you basically are the government. It's it's like the people on the right say, oh, you know, Obama, socialism, this is terrible. And Bush was really pretty much the same deal. But really, it's 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 fascism. That's what we have. We have, we have the, the, the corporate players are just in bed with the government. It's ridiculous. Well, that, that's what happens with, you know, I, I see the need for kind of cops on the financial street, just like you have, you know, uh, you get a ticket if you go through a red light. I think there's a value in having stoplights on the street and cops to enforce it. Uh, the problem is if the cops are on the take. <laughs> And some guys get to get to block off the streets and speed it and, and speed it will. Well, and, it's, and, you know, you know what? That's very a very good example of that is uh, Moscow, Russia. So in in Moscow, everybody has these 
blue sirens that they just pull out and stick on them. They, they stick to the top of the car with a magnet. And, you know, those are all the elite class, right? And there are many, many, many of them. They're not government. They're not emergency vehicles. They're just people. <laughs> well, they, you know, it, it's very funny that, that you know, because, look, here's one of the problems we run into. Because of the Great Depression, the federal government it guarantees guarantees the, the your uh, savings account guarantees the solvency of banks thereby. And therefore, if they, in return for the American public providing this, in, this no-fail insurance to the banks, we expect them to do certain things and, cer- and not do certain things. Like if we guarantee someone's savings account, you're not allowed to take that money out and go to Vegas for a weekend. I wish that they had instead of um, creating um, – collateralized debt obligations. Uh, you know, if they'd simply blown a few trillion in a bad weekend in Vegas, it wouldn't have been so bad. We could have, that would not have been as destructive as what in fact happened. Uh, we've, we've had, you know, that's the problem is that once we start down the path of saying, look, we really have to guarantee people's money and uh, your savings, which makes sense. But now you're saying to a private entity, whatever happens, it's all guaranteed. So go crazy guys. And that's the problem. When they say deregulated, they're, they're, the other side of the equation is, wait a minute. That's like saying, we're going to provide you fire insurance for your house, but we're now going to say it's okay to you know, just have a, a campfire in your living room. Well, the house could well burn down. You know, That's not a surprise. And these guys, it was like, if they made money, they kept it. If they lost money, we paid. This was one of the deeply troubling things. And then Obama, remember, as a result of some of this shenanigans, we've had millions of people lose their homes to foreclosure. And no one's had their home guaranteed. Obama was so proud of the fact that that they re uh, um, that uh, there were a quarter million mortgages that were um, rewritten to, so people could would not lose their homes. A quarter million out of four million. Okay, so. Basically, you know, one out of 20 homes approximately were saved. Most people lost their homes. He didn't do anything about it. So we didn't, we as people didn't get guarantees. And it's very important when you, when there's a mortgage and a foreclosure collapse, everyone in the neighborhood loses out. When you have that foreclosed home next to you with the weeds growing up and the, the yeah, windows. It's, it's a bad out, deal. It's, yeah. a, it's, it's a disaster. And so there was no, it, there was no, there used to be something called a social contract. We'd give these banks some protection, but in the in the end, all we wanted was a safe piggy bank, reasonable loans, a mortgage, and you know a, a loan for our kids to go to college. And instead, these became official, you know, government backed loan sharking operations. And and that's what I talk about in vultures and vote rustlers. In fact, I had uh, one of the last pieces. It's eight pieces for my investigative reports from BBC Television. And in the last piece called Goldman Sachs Attacks, you'll love this, Jason. In Vultures of Vote Rustlers, in that story, I don't know if people uh, are aware of this. Some of your sophisticated re, uh, you know, listeners do know this. Goldman Sachs was turned into a commercial bank with government guarantees, a government-backed commercial bank. It had been an investment bank. It was right, right. Of course, they, they all converted when the financial right. crisis happened. They, they, they just converted. all instantly became regular commercial banks versus investment banks. Uh, that, unbelievable. The, the purpose was so they could then get government bailout money because investment bank is just, you know, like Lehman Brothers, uh, they allowed that to go bust. So they said, oh, so the other said, well, we're not investment banks anymore. We're commercial banks, which is usually – you know, a bank with like, you know, where you can put your savings, and they have ATM machines and place and branches you can put your money in. Well, in in the story I did, I realized that Goldman Sachs, if it was a commercial bank, under the law has to have branches and ATMs and provide mortgages and student loans and provide service to its community. That's called the Community Reinvestment Act. That's by law. In other words, we give a guarantee to commercial banks, but they got to give us something back. And so I started investigating it. And sure enough, Goldman, now a lot of banks like Citibank, to, they don't want to bother helping the average person. So what they do is they give like a, a half a billion dollars to a bunch of community uh, banks, community credit unions, say, okay, you take care of our, of our good side for us. Here's a, here's a check. 
You need to loan you money. Goldman Sachs got $20 billion from the U.S. Treasury. And to fulfill its obligation to help the, uh, the, the public financially, it made a big shot $5,000 donation to a little community oh, bank. Oh, isn't that nice? That would be like, <laughs> let, let me see, that would be like me c- cutting up a penny and giving a little tiny portion of a penny. <laughs> and, then, and then what happened was, then they took back the 5000 You know why? Because they gave it to a community credit union, the Lower East Side Credit Union in, in New York, which is near Wall Street. They said, okay, that takes care of our obligations. It's five grand to this little bank, community bank. It also happened to be the bank of an organization called Occupy Wall Street. So when Goldman found <laughs> Yeah, they, they didn't like that, right? I remember hearing that story, actually, yeah. To the banker of Occupy Wall Street, they withdrew their $5,000 and told all the other banks, withdraw your money. This is the banker for Occupy Wall Street. Like when you, people put money in those buckets on Wall Street, they, they took it to this credit union. And so they removed the money. Now, that's illegal because, you know, another illegal activity because you can't it's it. They didn't give that money out of generosity. It's the law that they had to give this money out, even though it was like, it was like ridiculous, the amount. But even that they couldn't stand. So, you know, it's like the, the problem here is that but they understood in a way that a protest like Occupy Wall Street and bankers who supported something like Occupy Wall Street were ultimately a real threat to their bank because it was an expression of public anger. Whether you agree with the Occupy movement or not, it was expression of people who were just fed up to here and saying, we don't want to be in these commercial banks anymore. Forget it. And or or like these investment bank casinos wearing commercial bank clothing, which is what Goldman Sachs is. And so even today, I'm trying to figure out what it does, what Goldman Sachs does in return for all the money we gave them, because they are required under the law to add to, if they're going to be a bank, to be a bank. Where's my student loan for my son, guys? That's the law. And and once again, if I don't follow the law, the, you know, the, the, the troops are at my door, right? The police are at my door, right? If I don't have a license plate on my car, I drive down the street, I'll be stopped in three minutes. Goldman Sachs, for all the billions we gave them, is supposed to give us something back. It's called banking. And they haven't done that. But, you know, no one's saying a word because, hey, they're Goldman Sachs. And Obama says, you know, in the case of of J.P. Morgan Chase, hey, that's his favorite banker. When, When J.P. Morgan Chase was caught again and again and again in financial shenanigans, which we back because we guarantee this bank, uh, like the London Whale story, which is about a bank gone wild, losing billions of dollars, trying to corner the market and treasury bonds, which is what it was all about. They knew that they were doing something illegal. The top guys knew they were doing something illegal. And they said, oh, some small guy went wild. $10 billion wild? And again, the American public picks up the tab because we are guaranteeing them. And Obama's statement, after some people said now it's it's the fourth criminal or quasi criminal activity that we've caught uh, J P Morgan in, how come uh, how come you are not doing something to rein in this this uh, rogue bank? And Obama's statement was, and I quote: "This is your president saying, I wish other banks had managers like J." Uh, like Jamie Diamond. <laughs> well, if that happened, we didn't have anybody. We'd, we'd be eating out of garbage cans. Yeah, I know. Was, Unbelievable. I was stunned and asked him, well, why are you allowing, you know, under with under government supervision, allowing uh, Jamie Diamond to have these giant bonuses uh, given everything? And he literally said about J- Diamond, who is, uh, again, head of J.P. Morgan Chase, said, why? Why should we punish Jamie Diamond? And you know what, Mr. President, if you don't know why we should public punish J, uh, J.P. Uh, Morgan's CEO, a bank gone completely wild with our money, if you don't know why he should be punished, you really are not fit for that office. I'm sorry. Unbelievable. And, and, and you know, every couple of years, it seems like there's a big scandal with Merrill Lynch and some crooked dealings that they're engaged in and just goes on and on and on. Yet... Obama thinks that anybody who makes over $249,000 a year is flying around in a private jet and they should be, you know, demonized. 
it's just like at every level, you can tell the corporatocracy has bought the government. They, they own the Senate. They, they, just, they just own the government. Maybe not the Supreme Court, but they own the other two branches. <laughs> well, it's interesting. I mean, uh, one of the things um, that we find is that, you know, you, you have, uh, for example, Obama got up during the uh, presidential debates because Mitt Romney, whose worth is somewhere north of a quarter billion dollars, pays almost no tax. Well, his biggest tax loophole that he uses is something called carried interest deduction. And it, it really only applies to a few billionaires. There's very, very few people get to use this uh, loophole. And it's mostly billionaires who are speculators. It's not people, you know, this is, you know, job creators. Is, it's a real stretch. So even, in fact, Baron Rothschild wrote an editorial in the Wall Street Journal saying, we really got to get rid of this tax break. It's an embarrassment. I mean, you know, there's a lot of ways to save money. But this is like giving a tax break for speculation to billionaires is a little bit embarrassing. We should get rid of this. You know, if we've got to give up something, this is it. So Obama said that's the first, it's the one single loophole he said he was going to close. He didn't because his, his own buddies from Silicon Valley who were, um, who were raking in the billions said, wait a minute, that's our tax credit. So he didn't realize that Democrats got these tax credits, which were draining the treasury of billions too. So he never brought it up again. Instead, instead he eliminated the two per, the reduction of two percentage points in social security taxes. So you now instead of the billionaires having to pay taxes on their billions, Obama raised the by uh, two percentage points, added a two percent tax on wages. So if you work for a living, you got a two percent tax. If you avoid working for a living, you got a tax break. And that's that's the progressive president. <laughs> I'm not saying the Republicans would have done it any different, but you know, it's like this is this is a guy who's most who is supposed to um, you know say that you know made big speeches about inequality in America. You know what? Save me the speeches. Don't charge me for working for a living by raising Social Security taxes. It's crazy. It's just unbelievable. It is unbelievable at every level, Greg. Give out your website, tell people where they can find you and find the documentary. By the way, I, I've watched about half the documentary. Really interesting stuff. I highly recommend it. It gets better and funnier. Yeah, it's well. grim stuff, but it's funny. <laughs> if, if, you don't, if you don't laugh, I've missed it because it's so grim that you've got to laugh. Yeah, and right. uh, you know, it's, it's the only release we can have is a little bit of laughter among the absurdity. And in fact, it, it ends with, a, with, an actual, with an actual cartoon of uh, the Koch brothers and their vulture friends, little birdies feeding their little chickadee, Chris Christie. So uh, it, you know, so it's investigative reporting with cartoons, vultures and vote rustlers. And it's a DVD or you can get it as a download at www.gregpalace.com. By the way, this was put out by my not-for-profit foundation. Unlike my other films, it's, it's purely uh, to support not for profit, nonpartisan investigative reporting. But you'll have fun with it. It's about an hour and 10 minutes. So that's Vultures of Vote Wrestlers. Just go to www.gregpalast.com. W G R E G P A L A S T, gregpalast.com. And, you know, you'll get some laughs and a lot of information. And uh, I hope you'll enjoy it because it, it, you're going to see the stories. Almost all these stories were on BBC television in Britain. And you're going to see the stories that they don't let you see on the American uh, lamestream. Yeah. yeah, well, the, the American lamestream media is owned by the corporatocracy. So thank God for the Internet. Well, we have it. Make use of it, folks. So that's the, <laughs> that's the, that's the uh, admonition of the day here is to, to make use of the Internet, highly make use of it. Well, Greg Palace, thank you so much for joining us today. Again, you gave out your website. I highly recommend the documentary. And keep up the good work and keep exposing these people. Uh, true investigative journalism. Thank you. Jason, you do great work, and thank you for bringing me across the electronic Berlin Wall. Bye. Now you can get Jason's Creating Wealth in Today's Economy Home Study Course. All the knowledge and education revealed in a nine-hour day of the Creating Wealth Boot Camp, created in a home study course for you to dive into at your convenience. For more details, go to jasonhartman.com. 
This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company, all rights reserved. For distribution or publication rights and media interviews, please visit www.hartmanmedia.com or email media at hartmanmedia.com. Nothing on this show should be considered specific personal or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own, and the host is acting on behalf of Platinum Properties Investor Network, Inc. exclusively.